Thank you. Um, it's really my privilege to be here and um, share my story and just a little bit about uh, what I do. And um, I just sort of like to begin um, with saying that was a really great talk that we just had and I definitely relate to most of those challenges except maybe the first one because I had a lot of parental support um, that I need to acknowledge and sort of doing what I have had the opportunity to do so far. So what I also really like is the title of this conference which is Thinkers 50. But um, something which I wasn't planning to sort of share, but is I think it's also the collective consciousness right now is like, what are we all thinking about? And I think the same sort of worries and woes are weighing everybody down right now. Like what's going to happen at the end of the year? What's happening to our money? What's happening to our city? Uh, what's happening to the women in our city? So there's a lot of these questions and something interesting that the gentleman from the IS shared earlier, which has stayed with me through the morning is one example that he shared of um, it took someone 30 years to build 300 bridges and then three years to build 300 plus. So that's an interesting question. I think we need to ask ourselves irrespective of what institution or organization we're coming from, but what are those characteristics or what makes the kind of people who are able to inspire that kind of leadership and change and work. Um, saying that, uh, what sort of one of the inspirational um, things that led me to starting this project was in 2005 uh, when there was a lot of pressure being put on the G8 um, to raise the amount of money being put forward for poverty allevi uh, alleviation. And there was a series of concerts hosted called Live 8 uh, across the G8 countries and in South Africa. And they were in July, I think, of 2005. And I remember as a, as a kid, like, turning, tuning into the TV and watching the concerts in different parts of the world happening everywhere from Paris to different places, I think 10 different places. And what was most, I think, uh, awe-inspiring from that was that I think 3 billion people tuned in to watch those different concerts. They had more than, more than I think, 1,000 musicians perform. And they, through Live Aid as well as other... Um, movements happening in different parts of the world, they did manage to double the aid that was given from, I think, 25 billion to 50. And that was sort of being a, uh, someone who all through childhood was very involved with music. It, so it helped put into perspective for me that there was a very real social dimension to what was possible through the arts. Uh, so t Music Basti is a project that I started in 2008. And just to share a little bit, Um, about why we do what we do. So this is a um, sort of a quote that I really like to share that says, how do we live in a way that shows an understanding that we genuinely live in a shared world, not one that simply belongs to us. And while make poverty history was something that as a child was really um, moving and motivating for me, this project was something that was much, much, is much, much closer to home and something which I'll share a little bit about what we're doing this year. Um, but is something that we are trying to set up as a very local movement and hopefully something which can be replicated across other parts of the country later. Um, why we work with music briefly, um, scientifically, socially, music has shown a lot of uh, potential scope and evidence for being a tool for well-being, education, community building, uh, development, brain development for children, healing, communication, among many other uh, positive things that it's able to do. Um, along with this, if we also consider what's happening with education in our country today, um, and I think the Helka, the last issue of the Helka is quite interesting because it just highlights everything that's going wrong in education today, along with a lot of very positive stories. So this is just one to look at like why music and education are so integral and so important and something that we should start considering um, as complementary and as something that go together. Um, so this year we are starting a program in Delhi called Resound Resound uh, that brings together um, different communities across the city. Um, so we're working in a range of different low-income communities or slum communities with 20 musicians who we picked this year who are anywhere between the ages of 18 and 40. 
uh, along with a range of different partners. There are NGOs, there are training partners, there's an entertainment company, a training partner who's an NGO from this, uh, New York City. So the idea behind the project is to use music as a metaphor, but as a larger way of being able to bring together people from different walks of life, uh, from different parts of the world. Um, into a, a community building process that helps us to understand each other and engage with each other first before then understanding the dimensions of poverty or poverty alleviation and education and how we can seek to address those. Um, just to share with you a little bit about why the context of this project more than what we actually do in the project which is easier to gauge and to guess. Uh, there are two interesting publications which I've read, um, which are World Bank uh, publications. One is called Can Anyone Hear Us? Voices from 47 Countries. And another is called Moving Out of Poverty, which is an India-specific study of uh, four or five states across 10 years. And what's interesting, the three key things which I feel relevant in this context are, one, they talk about how poverty is a very multidimensional experience, specifically in terms of the psychological implications. You have educational, social, cultural, and others. But in terms of psychological implications, it implies everything from a sense, an overwhelming sense of hopelessness, helplessness, not having a voice, not having a face, shame, humiliation, something that trickles down definitely if also if you look at just the right to education and how it's being able to be accessed by children across the country. Uh, the second interesting observation from both those publications is, um, is the idea of aspirations and aspirations that, the, that people have and how those can be a very powerful force for upward mobility and to move uh, out of poverty. And the aspirations that a lot of parents have for their children are very, very powerful determinants of helping them to move from where they are into a more positive place. And the third, which is uh, most sort of closely connected with the project that I work with is this, the concept of creating a cultural identity that helps to humanize a lot of the very dehumanizing realities that poverty brings with it. So whether it's through creating relationships, engagements, having fun, getting, have, creating a dialogue which is um, not a charitable dialogue, uh, it plays a really important role in establishing that identity and helping people to understand each other better. I mean, there are many, many, many other very important and relevant uh, findings in these studies, but with respect to this, these were a couple which I thought would be important to share. Just a few points. Um, this is what we have in mind for this year, and we have very active online, so I'm not going to share videos and photos. That'd be great if you can check out some of the work we've been doing. But this is what we have planned this year. And I just wanted to share a little bit that I went through yesterday and today about what's happening with respect to this month, I think, marks four years since we adopted the right to education, and um, which implies free and compulsory education. But there are just a few statistics that I wanted to share before I close my presentation that highlights not just the, the importance of better education, but the importance of what education should imply. Um, and we also heard a lot about development and electrification and education and school buildings, but a couple of like examples on the other side of the fence. So there are, I think, in standard five right now, 58% of children cannot read at a standard two level. 46% of children in school can't do two-digit subtractions. 75% can't do two-digit divisions. 50% of children cannot recognize numbers between one and a hundred. And there are like a host of problems that sort of um, go within education, whether it's gender, the quality of teachers, sanitation, and the lack of uh, bathrooms for girls. In, one in four schools in India don't even have a toilet for girls. Safety in schools, uh, or safety going to and from schools. Access to schools themselves. Um, I think the right to education initially had spoken about how um, every child by 2020, that's in seven years, will go to school. But I don't, I mean, those numbers speak for themselves, I guess. So this sort of, just to close um, my presentation, what I would just like to share is uh, what we believe in, in through, one of, through this project is that community-based initiatives really have the power to change not just the paradigm of education, but the paradigm of how we understand communities that we live in such close proximity with, but don't understand at all. And for me, this has been a, a very like personally challenging process as well. And coming back to the first question, when we just look at the different, many different problems that surround us today as a city and also as a country, it's extremely discouraging, I feel, 
um, and what I would just like to um, say also is that while I feel it's sometimes the solutions don't seem to be presenting themselves before us, one incident after the other just leads to more dismay. Um, like what we heard, I think, from all the like different people who've spoken so far, it's, I feel that while I also feel extremely discouraged even while I share this presentation, I think the difference, what I would like to believe is that it's possible to have um, more structural change at the government level, attitudes where people are willing to believe that these kind of changes are possible. And as a young woman also in Delhi, I think this last year has been an extremely frightening year in a lot of respects but not cowing down and um, hopefully believing that change and positive change is possible, whether it's at the level of education, where I specifically work, or in every other facet. So that's what I'd like to say. And uh, we have um, more information available on Resound and the projects that we're doing in case anyone would like to get involved with similar kind of projects. So thank you so much.